Emil Cadillac here with FantasyNation.com. We have a wonderful pioneer of fantasy sports today who started his commissioning business back in 1995, one of the originals. I'm honored to welcome Mark Hanna. How are you doing today, Mark? Emil, I'm doing good. How are you doing? Not bad. A crazy time in uh, 2020, but uh, hopefully we'll all survive and, uh, and be safe and survive at the same time. Oh, I totally agree. So tell me, uh, tell me about your youth. Uh, were you interested in sports when you were young? Yeah, so I, uh, I grew up in northern Ohio, outside of Cleveland. And, um, you know, if you're from the Cleveland area, you are a huge sports fan, especially football. But I also was an Indians fan and a Cavs fan. Uh, interesting enough, uh, growing up, since uh, Cleveland really didn't have hockey, they had hockey for a little while with the WHA, but they didn't have an NHL team, so uh, I had relatives that lived in St. Louis, and I adopted the Blues at a young age, and uh, I've been a Blues fan since probably, you know, mid to late 70s at least. Um, so mostly Cleveland, but uh, with hockey, I've always been always been uh, attached to the Blues. So fan, football, though, were you, did you like the NFL at all? I loved it. I uh, <laughs> know the history of Cleveland football. Before I was born, they were fantastic. And then, of course, right after I was born, it was heartache after heartache. So you had, you know, Red Right 88 in 1980 with Brian Seip. And then you had the drive, uh, you know, the AFC Championship game against Denver. Then the next year you had the fumble. Uh, they would never been to the Super Bowl. The whole story. Uh, anybody that talks to me about Cleveland sports, I start with football and I talk about how, uh, you know, what kind of a heartache that's been. Still a Browns fan. Always will be. Um even with all the, the, the lousy seasons they've had the last two decades, uh, I, I just can't get away from it. And, I, I mean, I, I have a picture of me and my brother in the 70s uh, as Christmas presents. We both got full Cleveland Brown uniforms. I mean, we're talking the shoulder pads, the whole nine yards, <laughs> yeah, the helmets, and I just, I just loved it. I, I wore it out. It was fantastic. So. You grow up in northern Ohio. If you're not a football fan, something's wrong with you. And uh, that's and it, that's and interesting. That's not how I got into fantasy. Um, actually, I didn't get in. I didn't hear about fantasy sports at all until you know 1989 when, after St. Louis. But um, once I found out about fantasy, at, at of course, it's like oh, this is fantastic. Like, I not only follow my teams, but actually have a different interest in it. It made football even that much more exciting. So yeah. I, always been a football fan so when you learned about fantasy in 89 did you immediately get involved and have a team or how did that progress so i was working at uh, mcdonald douglas at the time and i had a co-worker that said hey you want to get in my fantasy football league and i looked at him like what are you talking about fantasy what and so he explained the concept and I thought, oh, you know, that's, that's cool. That's interesting. Yeah, okay, so we can draft actual players in the NFL, and I can follow them on Sundays, and I can, you know, get points based on what they do, and, and it's sort of a side game. I like this. This is fun. And <clears throat> that was my first introduction to fantasy. Um, you know, I did pretty well. I drafted Emmett Smith. I can't remember whatever, whatever year he was a rookie um, and won the league that year. Crazy. I drafted him, like, I don't know, fourth round. Uh, so I was I was set, um, I was hooked. Interestingly enough, I never really put the connection between playing fantasy and if making a business out of it right away. Um, I played probably for like three years till '92, and all the time I never thought about, you know, hey, I write software, right? So why don't I? Why shouldn't I not write? Because so, you know everybody was doing everything paper and pencil, and at first. The leaks were very simple. You get a touchdown, you get six points, right? There was no points based on yardage. There's no PPR. There was not, you know, no individual defensive players. There was nothing like that. It was just you had your regular players. They score, you score. So it's easy to keep track of. But it was boring, and it wasn't fair, right? So if you had someone that gained 200 yards and didn't score a touchdown, you get nothing. So we said, now we got to change this. So we added performance rules, you know. You know, points per reception, you know, n number of yards, if they, you know, whatever they did. Well, that made it a lot harder to track, right? And just so happened at that time, the 70s, McDonnell Douglas had what was called a continuing education course where 
you know, they would pay for your school to go learn more about software. And, and, and McDonnell Douglas is a defense firm. So I'm writing software in a language called ADA, which is a really cool language, but it's all defense contracting and that's it. So it's sort of dated and it's not very um, commercial. So I started to take these continuing education classes thinking I'm going to learn like C++ and Visual Basic and all the latest stuff that make myself more, let's say, um, attractive to commercial firms. And I did this, and I was probably through class when I put two and two together. And so, well, wait a minute, because I was learning Internet programming as well, right? Oh. Which is just coming out. We're talking 93. So Internet programming was just the thing. I'm like, I want to learn about this. And then I put two and two together and said, wait a minute, what if I put our league on the Internet? And I write it in the software where they can, watch, they can all look at it. So in 93, I put out a little pilot program for just our league and, <laughs> and put it on the, uh, I wouldn't say internet, it was for the intranet for McDonnell Douglas, which was you know, probably not the right thing to do. And, uh, you know, so everybody in our, in our leagues could log in and look at their scores. And it was very rudimentary, very simple. It was just reports. You know, you couldn't change your rules. I hard-coded our rules into the system. But it worked. And, and immediately people are like okay look you gotta you don't realize what you got here you got to do this in, in more broader sense and can i see this report and wait a minute and then the commissioner's telling me hey can i change the rules here can i do this can i do that and so i started adding more to the software in 94 i made it more more flexible uh you know so different leads can use it and i just put it i just put it out there now on the regular internet and i put it up i didn't advertise it you know back in the day web crawler was the was the browser i mean the search engine of choice so you know i put it out there and you know if you did the right search in web crawler you'd hit our site well people started finding it and they said um look can you do this can you add these roles for me and we use individual defensive players can you do that and I started adding all this stuff. And then I started in 94, I said, i got to research this. It sounds like there's more leagues out there than I. I, I never heard of this concept, but it must be pretty popular. And then I started researching. And then it's like, okay, there's way more leagues than I ever thought. It's around the world. Um, there's hundreds of thousands. And this is back in 94, and there are still hundreds of thousands of leagues. Now there's millions of leagues. And that's when I said, okay. Maybe I should make a business out of this. And so in 95, I started Real-Time real Fantasy Sports. It originally was incorporated in Ohio because uh, my brother was a 50% was a owner with me. Um, but as, within a couple of years, I realized I need more help. My brother's not a software guy. He was just helping me financially. And I looked at my brother and I said, you know, we need, we need customer support. We need another engineer. We need more servers. You know, the... the um, Per, the server was literally in my house. That's the first server. I said, you know, I don't have this. And I had a 28.8 modem. I said, I, you know, this isn't fast enough. We need a real facility. And so my brother said, look, I, I agree with you 100%, but I don't have that kind of money. So I got other investors involved in 98, reincorporated the company in Missouri in 98. And, you know, ugh. And, and then the stories really started because, you know, 98, we, we started advertising and it, it took off and we had growing pains. And, but that's a whole different set of stories I could tell you about. <laughs> but that's how it got started. Well, uh, when did you get Tim involved? Was he around that time when you expanded or some other names that you can bring up that are historical? For the um, Tim Jensen started in 1998. So here's, here's my favorite Tim Jensen story. There's a couple of them, and I'm Great. sure he won't mind me telling them. <laughs> so it. he started in 98. And so in 1998, we got more investors involved and got some, some capital put into the company. And so we hired a customer support person. We hired, um, oh, no, I'm sorry, we, we bought another server. We moved our server out of my house to another facility. But one of the... One of the things to save money for the investors was, look, you're not just putting money into this. You're putting your own sweat equity. So not only do you have to be an investor, you have to be actively involved. So some people liked helped out, helped out with the phone calls. Some people helped out with um, you know, designing the website. But Tim's job was to write software and set everything up. And 
you know, and Tim is amazing. You know, the, the, the work he does is sleepless. Well, me being the idiot I was, I was in charge of the database. And I'm thinking, we're going to save money however we can. So I found a free beta version of Microsoft's, you know, SQL Server database and said, oh, well, it's free. It's beta version. So let's use this. It, it'll work, and hey, we'll save money. Yeah, well, the first weekend of the season when everybody starts hitting the website, it crashed. And it's a beta version, so it's not supported. And uh, we were in trouble. People couldn't log in. They couldn't get their scores. They couldn't put in their lineups. My phone's ringing off the hook. So Tim and I had to transfer that all that database to another database as fast as we could. So Tim was living at my house. And he was literally sleeping in a chair in my office while we were transferring everything to a new database. You know, it took us a couple weeks. Uh, there were some bugs, but it got fixed, and we limped through the season in 98 because we had way more users than we thought we were going to have, and the database just couldn't handle, handle it. Wow. So we got through that. So in 99, um, we, we moved to another facility, and we started growing quickly, and we started adding more servers. So we actually had a rack of servers at a hosting, a professional hosting company, and we plugged all our servers into their outlets, and on the first Sunday of the season, the, the circuit trips and all our servers go down. <laughs> and Tim's calling the, the, the hosting company saying, guys, what's going on? And they said, well, you plugged all your servers into the same, you know, same circuit. And Tim said, yeah, that's the circuit you gave us. He goes, oh, no, no, no. Um, yeah, normally it would work, but if your servers start to really start piling up there and start working hard, you're going to trip that, that circuit breaker. So you need to plug it into another circuit. And Tim's like, where's the other circuit? And they go, oh, it's over there, you know, like not even close. And so Tim had to run to the hardware store to buy extension cords so we can plug half of our servers into a different circuit so it wouldn't trip on a Sunday morning. And Tim, I'm calling Tim saying, Tim, how's it going? How's it going? And Tim's telling me, um, well, hang on, a, he's talking to me on his cell phone. He goes, hang on a second, Mark, I'm driving the wrong way. And Limburg. And if you know what Limburg Boulevard is, it's a four-lane divided highway. And <laughs> he's driving the wrong, the wrong way. way? <laughs> the wrong way. And I'm, and I'm like, Tim, story. don't kill yourself. <laughs> so he stops and turns around, finds a hardware store, runs to the server company, plugs in everything to another, you know, shares the circuits, and we're up and running. But we lost probably about two, three hours there on the first Sunday of the season. Yeah. You know, it's just one of many stories that we, we joke around, you know, architecturally, we have a pretty, we had a pretty sound architecture. However, you know, you don't, you don't, you find a weak link, right? You find a, a place in the software where you didn't account for a hundred thousand people hitting that same code at the same time, you know, which hit the database, which bring it down. So you got to quickly fix that. All those things kind of happen. Um, our hosting company, I won't name them because they were good to us, but they started to get a denial of service attacks, not at us, but another at another company they were hosting, but it affected the whole building, and we were in it. And that they that happened for years, and it wasn't constant. It would just happen to be at the wrong time for us, and we finally had to move because it's like, look, we cannot be down for five minutes, especially on a football Sunday or when there's a lot of drafts going on. And they would be down for like 15, 20 minutes. And so we had to move somewhere else. But that's the nature of the beast. You know about this. I mean, if, if, sure. uh, if the Internet's not sure. constantly up, if our servers are down for any reason, if the software chokes, you have to fix it and fix it fast. And that's, that's Tim Jensen. I mean, I'm, I used to write software a lot. I don't do it as much anymore. Uh, but Tim is still a wizard. Um, Chris Thompson, I, I think you know Chris pretty well. He joined us. Um, I'm going to say 96, 97, I'm probably, I think 97. Uh, he's been invaluable. The man does not sleep. He, uh, we have um, chat rooms for all of our different games, especially our high-stake games. And, of course, with the nature of any chat room, you get people who start to fight with each other. And Chris Thompson is in those chat rooms constantly, monitoring them, being a... a, a sort of a, a it calms people down he's and i don't know how he does it i don't have the patience i get in there and people are arguing i'd say get the hell out you know i'm done with you and chris talks him off the ledge and 
He's he's the voice of reason. I can't stand being in those things. And to, I mean, Chris, he just he just takes it with a grain of salt. Um, Jeff Power, um, you know, our fantasy editor, has been with us uh, since probably 2005, 2006. He's amazing. He's got a brain for fantasy. That guy, I, I can't even imagine. Um, yeah, he's, in he's, our, won several uh, he's in our several awards. He's our in our uh, magazine uh, magazine leagues every year for the leagues every year for the diehards. Yeah, I mean he 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 writes nonstop. He does research nonstop. He uh, I I don't even know names of half the players that he knows like the back of his hand. He is so good. Um, he's he's loyal. He's a, he's a great guy. Um, yeah, two kids that you know, I just saw the other day. I love seeing them all the time. Yeah, we're a close knit family here. Um, you know, we go through some. You know, especially customer support people, we turn them over a little bit because they they move on, but. Mostly, most of the people that are here have been here. We have other investors. Uh, Mike Rooney was with us for a while. Um, he he was the software engineer and the part owner. He left for to be a CEO of another software company. So he took a good, he made a good move. Uh, he's still an owner with us. Uh, you know, it's just, you know, I can't believe I've been doing this for 25 years. I, it's just amazing. I see. People I've known, I've seen their kids grow up and go to college and graduate the whole Pretty time. Wild. So, so back in '98, did you guys go to the Tropicana Fantasy Sports Convention in the Tropicana Hotel in Las Vegas? I believe my brother Michael did. So, in the very beginning, '98, '99, 2000, um, <clears throat> they had those conferences like Labor Day weekend, yeah. and I could not leave my desk. You know, that was like the weekend before the, you know, start of the season. Actually, I think it might have been the weekend of the start of the season. So I could not go. Uh, so I would send my brother, who was still an owner, but, you know, he, he wasn't tied to software or architecture of the company. He's sorry about being a case of town. Oh, hey. I'd send him. Oh, hey. oh, cool. Here, I got another thing I forgot to show you here. If you could see your... Oh. No! <laughs> yep. That's me. That's my uh, artwork right there. Is it really? That is yeah. 1995. Really? Actually, yeah, it was, it was, it, it, the, the problem, I got it from the Wayback Machine, and this particular right. one was taken from 96, but it doesn't go back any further. Oh. Before. I love to see the Wayback Machine. No, there, I have, I actually have, a, you're right, I have a 95 version that, believe it or not, this looks 100 times better than the 95 version. You would, you would, you would just laugh out loud. Yeah, this is a um, good one, yeah. That was a, a, go ahead. That was the first. That was the. No, that was the second incarnation of real time fantasy sports as a logo. Um, I can't remember what year it was. Ninety seven, maybe, maybe ninety eight. This was actually, we actually December actually, of ninety six. This one was. That yeah. I got off uh, way back. By the way, uh, <laughs> noticing the football and the basketball. When did you guys get into uh, sports other than uh, football? So we never did uh, a commissioner product for basketball or. Baseball. Um, in 2006, when the UIGEA came around and they said that um, fantasy is legal, we decided to get into the um, fantasy gaming aspect of it. And then we took on basketball and baseball. Because unlike football, when we got in right away, by the time we even thought about doing basketball and baseball, there are already free services out there. Uh, and to try to get into the market after others have been established and it was free, to try to sell it is almost impossible. We still have a loyal, large, loyal football base because those people know our system and they don't want to leave and they don't mind paying $90 for a season than splitting it amongst 10 people. But to get somebody new into our site after free is already there. So we decided, we made the decision that not to go into baseball and basketball and other sports as a commissioner product. But you have money leagues and their contests. That's a different story. And in 2007, we did baseball. Um, we, we didn't do basketball for a couple of years. I think it was like probably 2009, 2010. We started doing basketball. We did auto racing for a little while. That just didn't take off. Um, we're actually doing daily golf right now. We just added that. So we have some sports, but uh, football's always been king. And football's the commissioner product that we've always had and we've always grown. And that is still, um, I would say, 
probably the biggest revenue generator for us still, but the money leagues are definitely growing daily and in season long. They are. That's good to hear. I did not know that. Now, a question I forgot to answer, ask early. As you were going through this process of thinking about starting a business and starting up uh, your business over uh, 1993 through 1995, when did you go find out, oh, my gosh, there's there's products out there already? <laughs> did you? Did you uh, well, in 94, in 94, I did a search um, on whatever, you know, web crawl or whatever was out there. And... I did fantasy football. I did a search for commissioner products. I did a search for, you know, you name it. I could not find a thing. Now, Mike Hall and I have this argument that he was out there in 94. I said, I started in 95. And I said, no, you weren't. I looked everywhere. He's like, no, I can show you. And I'm like, Mike, come on, come on. And I believe him. I just cannot find him. Um, I know that there was a, a um, commercial product that for your PC that did very simple things um, like it compute your scores for you if you typed in your rules and stuff like that. But it was not user friendly and it was a client side product. So meaning not everybody could access it. Only the person that had the software on there. That was could access Patrick it. Hughes' software. Yeah. And um, it wasn't, you know, we didn't even try to use it. It really wasn't worthwhile. And that, here's my, here's one of my favorite stories. So in 94, um, when I just started putting it out on the internet, uh, actually, sorry, 93, when I just started to develop it for my league, but I hadn't put it on the internet yet, I'm playing a game, of, uh, I play basketball, I, not anymore, but I used to, and I'm playing a pickup game of basketball, and my own teammate elbows me in the eye on accident. So I have a cut above my eye, uh, it's, it's starting to bleed, and it's swelling up, <laughs> and and, you know, I'm trying to play, and the guys are like, dude, go to the hospital. <laughs> get some stitches because that thing's, uh, you're not going to be able to see pretty soon. So I get in my car, and I drive to the hospital, and I go to, go in there, and they look at my eye, and I get the joke about, okay, who beat you up? And I said, you know, just take it. Somebody put stitches in this. So the doctor's stitching me up, and he's making small talk. And he says, so what do you do for a living? I said, you know, I'm a software engineer. He goes, oh, man, that uh, that." What have you in? He goes, do you do any, uh, do you write any internet software? And I said, you know, surprisingly, I just started doing some of that right now. He goes, oh, you know, my brother, no, I'm sorry, my brother-in-law, he wrote this program to help you, help your modem, help configure your modem so you can connect your modem to the internet. And he put it out there on his bulletin boards, and he just asked for a donation, and he needed an accountant for all the money that was coming in. Because if you can find something that you can put out there on the Internet that people want, it's a gold mine. And I'm sitting there, and the light bulb went on. I thought, wait a minute. You know, I'm writing something out there that's on the Internet that maybe maybe people might want. And that's, that's when I had to do the research. That's when I started to do the search. And that night, I came home, and I started typing in search engines. And that's why I couldn't find anybody else that did it. I couldn't find my call site. I couldn't find anything else. But I also started researching how many fantasy leagues are there. And that's when I found out about the fantasy league that started in the, in the 60s and, and how popular fantasy football was. And, and that's when I went, okay, this is, this is crazy. I had no idea that there's hundreds of thousands of these leagues out there. And nobody's, at least on the Internet, nobody has anything. Um, it, it was very, it didn't take long, right? Because pretty soon my, I did find my call site. And then CBS Sportsline joined in. And then not too many years after that, ESPN joined in. Um, and then in 1999, Rick Wolf convinced CBS Sportsline to go free for two years. I want to kill the guy for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Still mad at him about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, our, we, were, we were doubling and tripling in size every year. We still grew in 99 and 2000. But... You know, we, it was by 30% growth instead of 100% growth because wow. CBS. And then CBS went back to pay in 2001, and we had to run out and buy servers <laughs> because <laughs> everybody started coming back to us. Now, of course, you know, now, of course, I think 75%, 80% of them are free. And yet we still have our loyal following. But we got into the business just in time. We got in early enough. We got ourselves established. We got a good, strong base product known um, early on. 
And that's why, you know, football to this day, still we have tens of thousands of employees still that's, using this. Fantastic. Commission. Well, people like the comfort uh, of a product they know, and also you give them good customer support, and they've got message boards they go to, and, you know, 100 divided by 12 is not really a lot of money. No, and, and look, we always stress this. Our product is better. It's, it always improves, but our, our product is better because of our customers. They're the ones that call us and say, hey, can you add this feature? Can you make this easier? Can you do this this way so I can understand it better? Can you add, you know, they're the ones giving us the ideas and we're the ones that incorporate it. Now, we don't do everything everybody wants, um, but we do a lot. And they're the ones that have helped us grow. They're the ones that have made our software, that's made our software what it is today. Um, you know, we have great engineers, Chris Thompson, Tim Jensen, Gene Stone, Mike Rooney, all these guys that have contributed to us has been fantastic. But the ideas, the customer angle is from our customers. They're the ones that make us better. And then we have our customer support, which is outstanding. These guys are, are they do a job that I once did back in 1995, 96, that I will never do again in my life because I do not have the patience they do. I do not have the customer acumen that they do. I'm a business guy. I'm a software guy. I'm not a customer support guy. I'm just not. I mean, I'm, I'm nice to the customer, but I don't have patience. And these guys want to be, they want to be handheld through everything, and they want to be sure. shown everything, and I totally get it. I get it. I just, I can't do that. These guys, our customer support staff is, is That's terrific. great, and that really makes and, a difference because uh, people who, sometimes, you know, it's they know it. They just want you to hear it, you, you say it. Like, well, who should I start this week? Well, look yeah. at the cheat sheet. You know, guy is at 10 and the other guy's at 13, but they want you to tell them that. Because they right. want to feel like right. they're okay. I feel better now, and they get they get personal service. They want to be pampered. And yeah, I mean, difference. you guys, pay and, and they also they like you. And they also like in our commissioner product. They 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 pretty much know what's going on, but they still want someone to say yes, you did this right, or yes, you set this up right, or up yeah, right. I promise, I swear, when the game start, your scores are going to start tailing up or whatever. Yeah. And if something and goes point. wrong, we fix it. We fix it for them, and, and that's something that, that quickly help it. You got they call us and our guys help them out. That's worth the ninety bucks right there. Yeah, I I think that's a great great point. So what else did I miss? Did I miss anything about uh, the history? You have got some other stuff that I've missed asking, or you want to talk about? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the whole um, so our money league side, like I told you, is probably our, is is easily our fastest growing product or set of products that we have going right now. That is a whole adventure in itself. You know, we started it up in 2007 after the UIGEA was passed. Um, it took off right away. We started with football and baseball. We added basketball. But, Emo, you know this story. I mean, you know, it's going along great, and there always has to be someone or somebody or some company that has to just push it too hard, and, and that's what happened here. You know, I won't name names, but, you know, when we had a good product that, was following the law and following the rules and not pushing the envelope. And then people come along and push the envelope. Now, first it's daily games. And okay, well, daily games are legal because you have a variety of games that you're drawing your pool from. And there's, even in football, there are eight games or seven games being played with 14, 16 teams, 30 teams, whatever, that you can draw from. from. That's great. But it's still pushed in the envelope, then it was, what are we going to do daily golf, where it's one event? And uh, no, that's not legal. Well, yeah, it is. You know, and then, you know, it, it just, eventually, you knew it was going to happen, and it happened. Uh, you know, a, a governor in a state said, okay, now you're gambling. You're not, this isn't legal. I don't care what you say. And then you have the lawsuits, and then the states start to realize, holy cow, look at the money that's being made. Well, let's tax it. So on that one side, you have the regulations, and on the other side, you have the taxes. And what hurts the most is the smaller companies that are trying to stay on board, It's trying to keep up. My job now, I went from a software engineer to a CEO to a regulator. I mean, all I do is look at law and, and figure out, okay, well, we got to add this to our software because now we can't have deposits of over this amount for this month. Now we got to add this to our software. Now we got to add these legal terms. Now we got to make sure we do verification. You know, 
all because of regulations. And then, of course, I'm also now part accountant because now we're paying taxes. I got to make sure my taxes are up to date every single month. Oh, wow. um, I got to figure out the tax rates and all this, you know, New York, Missouri. You know, we're, we're officially licensed in several states, um, but some states we just can't. Indiana has a $50,000 a year fee. Um, we can't. We don't do enough money leagues in Indiana to, to justify was that, that. Was that Illinois you said? Uh, sorry, Indiana. Indiana. Sorry, I, I wrote the But what's interesting is, well, all right, never mind. Keep going. I've, I've got things to say, but I probably shouldn't. No. <laughs> no um, you know, so we have to fight those fights. Um, we have to take each state one at a time. Um, you know, and if, if a state says you can't operate, it hurts our business. I, I Real quick story. So we're not allowed to be licensed in Indiana because of their fees. Well, we have people who live in northern Indiana, and they say, well, wait a minute. What if I go to Michigan and sign up? And that's legal because it's geolocation, right? It's not where you live. It's where you're at when you, when you purchase your entry. So we have people who drive north from Indiana into Michigan, and they go, okay, I still can't buy an entry. Why? And we say, because our geolocator is still saying you're in Indiana and you're not far enough from the border. So they drive further and further north <laughs> into Michigan. Until they finally go, oh, you're in Michigan. Then they can purchase their entries. And then they have to keep their entries because if they have to repurchase, they got to go back into Michigan. So they purchase a bunch of entries into these, into these games and they come back into India. It's ridiculous. Um, but that's what has to happen to make it legal. And that's what we're fighting with. That's the, that is the landscape of this business now. It's all about regulation, taxes, staying legal. Um, and now the whole gambling is coming into it, right? Now states are saying, oh, you can't have gambling, but you either have to have a brick-and-mortar site to be a gambling site or you have to have this regulation or, you know, and so we're battling, telling these states that we are, we're not doing that. We're still fantasy, so don't change the laws for fantasy to make it as hard as for gambling because then we're really in trouble. So we have that going on as well. Wow, I... Uh... That's dizzying. I, I, it's, um, it's sad, really. It's sad because we had control of all this before the Daily showed up, um, and you know one of the part, the like you said, repeating you, the problem with the Daily was they were spending millions of dollars a day on advertising. You couldn't, yeah. you walk into a toilet and there's a TV with a logo on it. I mean, it was uh, every <laughs> sport you could come up with. There's the logos, and. Unfortunately, the state said, you know, the politicians said, hey, money, we see money. And all of a sudden, right. the UIGEA from what was it, whenever they came out, 06, I think you said, didn't matter anymore. It was all gambling. And then once they started to get their revenues, they said, oh, okay, it's okay now. And I'm like, right, right. Just, and, the whole thing is, yeah, leaves and, me. Go ahead. No, and for for a lot of that time, the state's, I mean, they didn't realize that these these daily companies were operating deeply in the red. I mean, they were investing hundreds of millions of dollars using venture capital money and not seeing a profit at all. And they honestly didn't care because they're trying to corner the market, which I understand that it's not a bad policy. But, you know, all the states saw was, oh, well, you're spending $200 million a, a quarter in advertising revenue must be making a ton of money and we're trying to tell them no it's not there you're going to see when the tax revenue comes in that they're going to claim zero because they don't have revenue um yeah. we we pay taxes it's not a ton of money but we do pay taxes um it's growing and it, there is tax revenue to be realized and that's fine i have no problem with that so long as the tax rates are fair and they're especially fair to smaller companies and it, the regulations aren't insane. We're okay with it. You know, if it's not hard to get a license, we'll pay a fair amount of taxes just to 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 stay in the state. Um, but it, every state is a battle. That's the problem. You know, you go to Indiana and you say, guys, you're charging fifty thousand dollars. You're losing tax revenue because all of our small, all these small businesses, are not going to be in your state. Um, and not only that, but your own. Uh, state your citizens are going to move and not move but they're going to go to another state and purchase and that state's going to get the tax revenue not you so you know 
Do they Tomorrow. get that when you go to Indiana and I say, don't, hey? Some do. In, Indiana hasn't yet. Um, some have lowered it. In my own state, Missouri, uh, we lobbied here. Tim went to Jefferson City. I went to Jefferson City. Um, it looked like we were going to have a fair tax rate, and at the very last second, they changed the law and made it 1%. Now we stayed and we paid because we're in this state and we want to be licensed in our own state. But since then, finally, after more lobbying and more you know, discussions, we finally got the tax rate back down to something reasonable. Now, did the um, FSTA help said, you uh, lower that tax? Um, not really. Okay. Not really. I mean, Sorry. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm being careful here. Yeah, um, we don't have to talk about it. You we'll, know, we'll turn the camera off and talk no, about no, it. No, no, no. I mean, it, it's, it's politics, right? It, it's, it's the meat grinders, how the sausage is made, and, and the sausage wasn't made the right way originally. It was, let's just say, the interest of some of the people in the F FSTA took precedence over some other yeah. FSTA. Essentially, other companies. essentially a season law got, got long got, in my opinion, season long got thrown under the bus for daily, yeah. and, reg, and regulators in, 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 in the states, they just blanketly made a policy, and they were either told to do that or they were not told not to do that. And so season yeah, long no. got thrown under the bus, in my opinion. Yeah, no, that's that's right. And people looked at and it. People looked at the money in daily, and then they said, "Well, that's 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 where the money is. So let's <clears throat> let's worry about that." And season-long people were saying, "It doesn't work like that with us. We're not, you know, you can't do that with us." And you know, at the end of the day, things got straightened out, and things are better. Good. Um, we try to go into each state with the knowledge that we're going to be able to to get good regulations and get good taxes and be able to do things the right way um, but it doesn't always work out that way that's just that's just the way it works so yeah so um so, hey you got a song there Ooh, yeah good? sorry it's i don't know what's going on something's here going on so um do you have any uh funny stories about customers that weird things happen to them or stuff like that off the top of your head <laughs> Do I have oh, email? How much time do you get? No, uh, all time. We got time. Our, our commissioner product customers are incredible. They're very nice, and they think we're gods because we can write software that that calculates their scores and handles their rules and does everything for them. They sometimes, you know, obviously, if our site is down and they can't change something, they that. But that's totally understandable. It's the money league customers and you probably know a lot about this email because you know especially the higher the stakes Tim Tim Jensen has a um, he has a, a expression that's perfect he says that any money league player the minute they sign up for their for your contest on your site they've already won the only question is how did you cheat them out of their winning that's their attitude <laughs> haven't heard that one that was so a good they one. don't yeah, and so if they don't win, it's because, oh, you did this to me or because the the rules weren't the way I wanted them to be or because this guy cheated and you let him cheat. And, you know, um, so you always have to deal with that. Um, you have the customers that are just, uh, they're conspiracy theorists. They think that every time a trade is made that it's, it's, it's a conspiracy against them, um, you know, you got to tell them no it was a fair trade. You're allowed to do that, um, and, but then you do have the people who try to cheat. Uh, you know, we had a we had a customer that in our, one of our baseball leagues um, signed on and and assumed the identity of I believe his sister-in-law in a different state. You know, so when he did the verification, all it matched up. But then it was making midnight trades uh, with a, a guy. Um, literally making the trade in the middle of the night um, for and a very lopsided trade, and we caught it immediately, and we started looking, and we thought, well, these two people don't know each other. They're in different states, different names, so I'm not sure what's going on. And we looked at the contest, and they weren't in any other contest together, so it's like, huh, you know, this doesn't smell right, but it looks fine. But then we started really digging, and we found out that, no, the IP address of that woman in Kentucky is actually the same IP address as the guy in Florida that he's doing the trades with. And 
back to us his brother. Um, and when we figured that out, we looked back at other trades and realized, okay, these guys are, this is collusion. And so we, our rule is collusion, you're disqualified, period. You're done. Yeah. And, of course, one of the brothers was in first place. You know, that would make sense because he's getting the good players from the other guy. Um, you know, is and we, we don't like to do it. Well, we said, look, sorry, this is collusion. And then yeah. we, we disqualified yeah. them. And, this, I mean, the, uh, the insanity then ensued. And like I said, this is why I can't be a customer support person because, of course, they call our office. And at first, our customer support is trying to be understanding and nice. But after a while, you just can't. They're screaming and yelling and swearing and, and threatening lawsuits. And we're showing them all the data. And we're saying, look, dude, you faked your identity. You... You did these ridiculous trades. You had two people in the same house doing the trade. This is against our rules as well. Didn't matter. Yeah, they, they just they go crazy. And then What's, you have the people that are so anal retentive that they think, you know, everything should be exactly a certain way and the rules should be exactly a certain way and you should change this and change that and change this. And like that. Yeah, just those people. What's interesting about that guy is he caught red, got caught red-handed and still had the audacity – to ignore the data and be mad at you. It's funny how people who cheat sometimes have that situation. What? Uh, yeah. Your, this, go ahead. In 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 some of your money leagues, do you have no trading, or are they all trade leagues? No, they, we have most of them are no trading. The big money leagues are no trading because we used to have trading and it was just impossible. And not because the trades were bad, but because the trades were good. And it benefited both teams. Well, the other teams that aren't in that trade would go crazy. And at first, we used to have, um, you know, you had to, a, a majority of the other owners had to approve the trade, right? Well, no, no trades ever went through. No matter how fair they were, yeah. no matter how good they were, yeah. they never went through. And so people went insane. So then we said, okay, fine, we're going to have an algorithm. And it's a pretty good algorithm that we checked. And it was good trade. We let it go through. Well, then people went crazy because yeah. good trades went through, even though they were good trades and they didn't like that. And we just couldn't. Yeah, you know, we still have trading leagues, but they're in smaller, smaller denominations. The bigger yeah. leagues, we just can't. Because well, I don't people know. If, yeah, I don't know if you remember when when Lenny and I started the WCOFF. We created it in '01, and the first draft was in uh, '02. We did not do trades. We decided that it was just going to be a yeah. pain in the ass. And really, the drafting and the uh, free agency and the management of your team creates a, a champion. And boy, was that a good right. decision. It was fantastic. Um, yeah, we followed that lead. We, uh, we, I don't think we've ever had trading in our high money leagues. We just can't. I mean, and, and it's amazing how, you, just to get on that topic about, you know, drafting and, and, and um the waiver wire and, and junior team during the year. I have arguments with people that run poker sites to say, how come the UIGEA excluded you and not us? And I say, because you're gambling and we're not. And they say, what are you talking about? You have to have skill to play poker. I said, you absolutely do. I'm not arguing that point. Mm -hmm. The point is I could be just a novice poker player, right? I can know the different hands and know what hands beat other hands. But if I can draw an inside straight or if I can get a full house, you could be an expert. You're not going to beat me. You're not. You can fold and not, you know, and, and realize I have a good hand and uh, you know, maybe I can tell something to you, but you're not going to beat me. I am going to win because my cards are going to beat your cards every time. And I'm not going to fold. It, I think so it basically hard. comes down to a game of skill. If there's skill that you can read a player and that you understand the statistics probabilities, whereas as in, in poker, you still have random cards, where in the NFL, you yeah. kind of know what this guy usually rushes for 100 yards a game or usually gets this many catches. Right. And I can statistically use that. And, yeah, it, the reality may be different. Of course, you can argue that that's random, too, and it has some randomness to it, or we wouldn't play it. It wouldn't be any fun. But, yeah, it's funny right, that they but argue that. The ultimate arbiter in poker is cards. That is the ultimate decision maker right again mm -hmm. i can bluff you and make you think i have a good hand but if i have a good hand go ahead try if i have good cards you will not beat me yeah gotcha. in fantasy yeah. there's far too many factors there's just too many injuries the guy gets in a doghouse it's a rainy day 
Um, the defense I'm playing against is, you know, stacked, you know, with defensive backs that might never see catch a pass. Um, it's they're coming off a bye week. Uh, it's playoffs coming up, and they're going to be resting some of my players. There's so many factors. Or their there's coach no is way. Belichick, and you have no idea what he's going to yeah. do. Oh. Or or the coach is Belichick, and he lies about the injury report. Oh god, that drives me crazy because he would always clever. say players were fine and they'd be hurt or vice versa. That's so, true. He's got um, everything. Yeah, I mean, there's too many factors. This isn't just the luck of the draw, and maybe I can figure out what you have, and maybe I can bluff you. This is, I mean, times how many weeks, and then you have waivers where you know a guy gets hurt and you want to pick him up off waivers, or this guy gets hot and you know picking up the right player players off waivers, or the draft itself, and knowing knowing how other people draft and when to hold off on a certain player, or draft him early. No way. There's no comparison. Yeah. It's just, By the way, and uh, if you want proof, yeah. By the way, uh, back to the COVID virus in the 2020, are you guys doing any, thinking about any adjustments like adding another free agency on Sunday morning because they may declare somebody uh, un- unavailable due to a temperature rise or anything like that? We have, we gave that thought. Um, ultimately, our decision was it is up to, it's just another factor the owners have to factor in, you know, ahead of time. Be smart. Change your change your composition of your lineup and in, in your roster based on that. Uh, okay. Do your homework. You know, if you have Zeke Elliott on your team, he had COVID. You're yeah. good, right? So it should be. Yeah. You may draft him high. You may you may draft him ahead of Saquon, Saquon Barkley because he had yeah. COVID. Yeah, that's um, a good point. Just yeah. no. So we have not. It, it, I'm sure people are going to complain about it. We've had requests already, especially in our high stake leagues, more roster spots for that. Um, we're not going to do that. Uh, it's just it's just another factor in 2020 that you have to worry about with your roster. Cool. That's all we can do. Cool. Well, congratulations on your incredible career. You're truly a pioneer of fantasy sports, and got some great stories too. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I can't believe it's been 25 years. Um, you, Emil, um, you know, Charlie Weger, all those guys that were there with us from the very beginning, we're all in the same, you know, we're, we're brothers of a, a you know, with a, of a different mother, as we say, <laughs> uh, but we're all in this together. And, you know, your, your contests have, were so successful, it led to other ones, um, FFPC, us, um, the TFC, you know, all of these are because you guys set the bar i mean really you guys had an incredible contest uh we just carried it on you know we had my call over at my fantasy league i joke around with him he's a competitor but great guy um you know he's he's i'm glad he's in the industry it's 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 a lot of fun uh, it's been a lot of work it's been a lot of fun but i like you know i knew you for how long emo <laughs> you know it's sure i can't remember you know, we, i'm not sure if you know this that's a problem with a lot of this I've forgotten. Oh. Luckily, you guys remember a lot, and we get on video, and we have a good historical record of what <laughs> happened. But yeah, I'm not really Well, sure most I'm people forget me right after the video, so that's, there's that. But, uh, well, you no, said, I, I by mentioned, the way, let's, let's mention you were on the, uh, and may still be, I'm not sure, of the board of the Fantasy Sports Trade Association for many a year. Do you, uh, do you remember how long? Yeah, I'm, on, I'm not on it now. Um, so I, I, I did my, my penance. And <laughs> no, I, I was secretary for a while. I was oh. on the board. It was an honor to be on it. Um, quite honestly, though, a lot of work. Um, you you know this as well. A lot of work, and you don't get paid. You might get a perk here and there, but that's about it. And when you're when you're trying to also run a company, it's it's tough. I don't know how some of those guys do. You know, Rick Wolf and those guys who've been on forever. You know, good for them. Um, I could not do it. Constantly, I could do it for a few years, and I believe every person in the industry should try to get on that board. I truly believe that. Yeah. Understand what they have to do. Understand the pulse of of the industry. When you're on that board, you you very quickly realize how how you know different each company is and and their needs and and how hard it is to keep the FSTA going. So, you know, hats off to all those people that are on it now. Yeah, well, that was great. You put those years. I actually was on the board for six years, and I finally just said, I, yeah. I've got, I'm, I, I really got to focus more on time on my business. 
and I, I stepped down. But uh, of course, now it's the FSNGA, Fantasy Sports and Gaming Association. Right. I gotta keep. It's so easy right. to say FSTA. So. Well, that's all I so know. Much. That's all I'll ever call it. <laughs> yeah, I just we're too old. Just you know, we remember right. one thing. Well, anything else you'd like to add before we end? No, that's it. Uh, thanks for having me on. I greatly appreciate it. Um, you know, before we had this, before we had the video rolling, we were talking about how you reached out to me, and I said, "Yeah, I'd love to do it." And then I totally forgot. Then COVID took over. Um, you know, and then I totally forgot. And then James Sarah, another pioneer in the industry, you know, contacted me and said, "Hey, you know, you should reach out to Emo." I said, "Yeah, I think I will. I think I'll reach out to him." And then you said, "You dummy! I already contacted you." <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. So uh, thanks, thanks for having me on. Well, there's um, there's, there's no know, time I'll, limit on the uh, honor of a pioneer of fantasy sports, and it's just <laughs> and it's growing. We're up to like 33 uh, videos now. I want to get Tim. Uh, cool. He seemed a little. Tim seemed a little. Uh, I'll ask Mark. I already did, you know, and he. I still like to get Tim on just because he he was Brown way back, you know. Some of the guys, you know, and we've even got yeah, some guys that were uh, sketched on. Where, there's names in the '80s that, um, like Cliff Carpentier. I can't get a hold of that guy. I'd love to be able to get him on for a few minutes, but uh, it's a it's a great history that we've got, and I'm glad that uh, we're getting it on video uh, so people can watch. And Sarah told me a month or so ago, he wrote, he listened to every single video, which was like about 14 hours worth of video at the time. I said, you spent 14 hours yeah. watching those videos. That was pretty cool. But hopefully it'll make a great history and we can keep it around for a long time. Yeah, I hope we're here talking, you know, in, in at least years from now, right? That'd yes, cool. absolutely. Well, thank you so much, and again, congratulations on being a pioneer of fantasy sports, and let's all be successful in 2020 with all fingers crossed. Yes, thank you. Appreciate it.